Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you, and as always, glad that you tune in and to uh, watch the program. Had some good calls coming in on what does the Bible say previously, and and uh, some of the calls that came in, <clears throat> we're going to be addressing, actually addressing some of those tonight as well, so we hope that you will stay tuned for that, and uh, maybe we can help clear up some things that were said, especially about the way uh, we conduct worship in, at the Church of Christ that's meeting in Eden. We're meeting at 250 The Boulevard in Eden. Here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653 or 336-394-5721 and uh, wordfromlord at gmail.com. This is where you can come by and visit with us and, and study God's Word with us. On Thursday nights at 7 p.m., we've been discussing a, a series of lessons called uh, Rightly Dividing the Word and it's actually just things that are necessary to get out of God's Word what God put in. And uh, I think it's been a very good study. And uh, so uh, uh, we're still doing that on Thursday nights. And if you'd like to come by and visit with us, we're, we'd be more than happy to have you with us. If you're in Danville or Martinsville, you can meet with the Saints at 823 Starling Avenue or 120 American Legion Boulevard in, uh, in Danville and uh, Martinsville and Danville, respectively. So uh, if you would like uh, uh, to examine the Church of Christ, the church you read about in the Bible, that's where you can do that. Now, one thing we want to be talking about tonight, friends, and I'm going to get right on into my lesson, has to do with the church. You know, oftentimes when people talk about the church, they use it in reference to the building or to the place where they, uh, where they assemble. Now, just because people come to a place of worship does not mean it's the house of God. Oftentimes I hear people talk about the building as being the house of God. When Micah and uh, uh, two other brethren went over to Fairview Baptist, I think one of the preachers threatened to call the police on them to run them out of the church. Well, the church is not the building. The church is the people. And I know people are understanding that because more and more they're calling and correcting us when really probably we're the reason why they know it because we're the only ones who really get back and talk about the church the way the Bible does. The church is the people. But the Bible does talk about the house of God. The Bible does talk about the house of God and, and it refers to the group of people. But if you ask people where they worship, they will likely tell you a man's name in order to identify the church that they're a member of. And it may not be a man that is local to them. In other words, sometimes... I know from, uh, from living up in Martinsville, sometimes people say, well, where do you go to church? And they say, I go over Bishop Kellum's church, you know, or I go over Mark Price's church. Well, you're right. That's their church. That's their church. It's not the Lord's church. It's, it's simply uh, uh, a, a church that a man has built. But people are members of a man's house when they are members of, say, the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church is wearing the name of Martin Luther. You see? Or you might have St. Paul's Cathedral or St. Paul's Holiness Church. Or you might have St. Luke's Church. Or you might have a, a church that's named for St. Mary or Mother Mary or whatever. And they're named after men. They're not named after the Son of God who died for the church. We're talking about finding the right house where you can assemble with the house of God. Now, when you talk about churches, just stop and think how many are really known by a man's name and not by God's name. How many houses of worship are identified as places where a man's church assembles and not the church that you read about in the book that was bought and paid for with the blood of Christ, thus the church of Christ. You see, friends, I submit to you that this is not these houses of worship that are named after men, are built by men, are churches of men, not churches of Christ. That is, they don't belong to Christ, they belong to some man. We are looking for the house of God, the house that God has sanctioned, the house that God has pitched and has, has erected, and not a house that a man has built or one that bears his name. The psalmist says that except they except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. We're looking for the house of God. 
What we want to do tonight is we want to learn a lesson about a man who was told to go to the house of God. Now, you might be thinking about the uh, publican and the uh, uh, Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray in Luke 18. That's not right. We're talking about a man who was told to go to the house of God and learn some lessons from that. And I want to show you from the Bible that we are, are to learn a lesson about going to Bethel. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, churches that are named Bethel, New Bethel, Bethel this, Bethel that. But Bethel is a word that simply means house of God. Just because a place is named Bethel doesn't mean that it's really the house of God. But when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau, he came to a place that he identified as the house of God. In Genesis 28, verses 16 and 17, it was here that he came and he, uh, you may re recall the story, he uh, 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 lay down to rest and he had a dream, Jacob dream. And if we back up to Jacob, uh, Genesis uh, 28 and verse 12, and he dreamed a dream and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it to thee uh, and to thy seed. Give it and to thy seed. And the seed shall be as the dust of the earth and shall be spread abroad uh, to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places where thou goest, and I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. Verse 16, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, watch it, and he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took stone that he had put for his pillows and set for a pillar and poured oil upon it, upon the top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. It is the house of God. He called that name Bethel. Now, friends, we want to learn a lesson about going back to the house of God because Jacob was told to go to Bethel. Now, Bethel, the house of God today, is different from the Bethel of Jacob's day. But the lesson that we're going to learn is going to the house of God. Four things that are involved in going to to Bethel are going to the house of God. Here's the lesson number one. The first lesson is, has to do with education. In Genesis 35, in verse 1, listen to what God tells uh, Jacob. Genesis 35, in verse 1. Sorry about that. Genesis 35, verse 1. And God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel. And dwell there and make there an altar unto God and appear, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Jacob is going to learn a lesson. Jason is going to learn a lesson about going to Bethel. He should have remembered what took place when he was at Bethel the first time. He should have remembered that it was at this place that he actually saw the uh, ladder descending uh, the ladder and the angels ascending and descending upon it. He should have remembered that this was the house of God. He should have remembered that this was a place where he went when he was in distress. Now, did my monitor just go out or did the whole signal go out? <clears throat> Hello in the control room? Uh, he should have realized that this was, this was a place where he went in distress. Here's a lesson. When you are in distress, turn to God. Jacob should have remembered that lesson. He should have been educated that going to the house of God is where you need to be when you're in trouble. It was here when he, he fled from Esau. Esau wanted to kill him. In Genesis 27, verse 41, we'll, we won't take the time to read that, but you'll recall that Jacob, Esau wanted to kill Jacob because Jacob tricked him or tricked Isaac and got him to bless him, give him the birthright and give him, give him the blessing of the firstborn that belonged to Esau. And it was because Esau wanted to kill Jacob that he fled and came to the house of God. And now he's troubled again. In Genesis 34 and verse 30, you recall that what has happened is Jacob's sons have actually killed the people of the land because they, uh, one of them raped their daughter you can go back and read this in Genesis 34. 
They rape their, they rape their sister, excuse me, rape Jacob's daughter. They, they rape Jacob's daughter and two of his sons, Simeon and Levi, slew the inhabitants of the land. They slew the inhabitants because they had done so to their sister. And Jacob says there in Genesis 34 and verse 30, uh, let's see if I can get here to it. Genesis 34 and verse 30, and my signal's gone again, so I'm not, I'm having trouble. I'm in blind in here, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> He, he, is, uh, he says, now do, the inhabitant, do I stink to the inhabitants of the land because they have, they have, uh, you have uh, I've killed them. He says, you have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against and slay me, and I shall be destroyed in my house. And they said, should, uh, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? And so what we're finding is Jacob is in a situation that he ought to realize the best place to go when you're in trouble, whether it be you're fleeing from your brother who wants to kill you, or whether you are feeling like you are in trouble with the inhabitants of the land, the best place for you to go is back to Bethel. Go to the house of God. You would think that he would have learned this lesson. The house of God is where you need to go to find God. Now, let's make some, let's make some practical application. Why do people live in fear and distress when they could be in the house of God? You know, there's a lot of people today that are in worry and in fear. They're in dread. They're, they're, they're losing their jobs. The economy's going in the tank. Their taxes are going to go up. Everything's going bad for them. And yet the first thing that they do is they rely on themselves. They start going to the government for assistance or they start going down to the to the uh, uh, local handout store for assistance when they ought to go to Bethel. They ought to go to the house of God. You see, that ought to be the place where you actually dwell. Remember what, Gen what Jacob was told? In Genesis 35 and verse 1, he was told to go to, the, to Bethel, go to the house of God, and dwell there. You need to stay there. You need to abide in the house of God. It ought to be that you are part of the house of God and you never move. You see, the house of God... As we said before, it's not a physical building where you need to go and find sanctuary. It is a spiritual building. It is a spiritual temple built up with lively stones, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. It is a place where you need to go and dwell. That is why we find in 1 Tim Timothy 3 and verse 15 <clears throat> that Paul says, that Paul says to Timothy, he says, if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. There are certain things that you need to realize that you ought to, and one is you ought to abide in the house of God because that's where Jesus is in charge. Notice this, in Hebrews 3 and verse 6, in Hebrews 3 and verse 6, But Christ as son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope unto the end. Notice this. We can be in the house that Christ is son over if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope unto the end. But you know what happens, friends? What happens is there's a lot of individuals who have obeyed the gospel of Christ and they have become a member of the church of Christ. That is, that is, they have become a living stone, a lively stone in the spiritual house of God. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. Notice this. As lively stones, they are built up to a spiritual house. They have become part of the spiritual house, the church of Christ, but yet they don't dwell there. They don't dwell there. They'll say, you know what, I, I've obeyed the gospel. I'm a member of the church of Christ, but I'm not going to assemble when the house of God assembles together. I'm not going to come to the assembly. I don't have to go to the assembly. I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to go out and, and uh, 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 go deer hunting. I'm going to go out and go fishing. I'm going to go anywhere except where the house of God is assembled. So you're not dwelling in the house of God. You haven't... You've forsaken the assembling of the house when it comes together. 
So there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm part of the house of God. Well, funny, I've never seen you there. See? It ought to be the case that when you uh, uh, get into trouble in life, you ought to stop and realize, maybe I need to check my relationship with the house of God. Because I know that some of you watching out there, dear brethren, I'm calling you brethren because I'm talking to the brethren. You've got troubles in your life. You've got struggles in your life. And instead of putting God first in your life, the first thing you do is you run back and you hide or you stay away. When really what you ought to be doing is like Jacob, you ought to go to the house of God and you ought to dwell there. You ought to be getting built up. You ought to be getting edified through the teaching of the word. See, if you want to be educated on how to endure into the end and you want to be educated on how to, how to be... Uh, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and you want to know how you can endure to the end, like we just read in, in Hebrews 3 and verse 6, hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, you need to go to the house of God. That's where you're going to be educated. What are you learning about God? What are you learning about God when you stay at home? What are you learning about God when you go down to a another man's house who didn't die for that house. You go to worship with the Baptist or the Methodist or the Lutheran. They didn't die for, uh, Jesus didn't die for those churches. You're going to go to another man's house and you're going to dwell there and then you're going to pretend that God's going to bless you. See, the lesson Jacob learned was go to Bethel. Go to the house of God. The house of God today my dear friends and neighbors and brethren, is the church of Christ. And if you're outside that church, you're outside that body of Christ, that means you don't have the security and the refuge that you will get if you flee to the house of God. See, the house of God assembles on the first day of every week. And we come together during the week to build ourselves up, to strengthen ourselves. If we are lively stones built together into a spiritual house, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, coming together during the week and studying the Bible together is the, is the mortar that holds us together. See? You can't, you can't hold a house together without the mortar that will hold the stones in place. And the first thing that happens is people, they will say, well, I'm going to come be a part of the house of God but they don't stay long enough to get any mortar on them. They don't stay long enough to get any cement that will stick them to the rest of the living stones. And the next thing you know, they're rolling down the hill. See, they're not dwelling in the house of God. They're not dwelling in the house of God. But the righteous dwell in the house of the Lord. The Psalm 23, the Psalm that everybody quotes. Remember the psalmist said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, no. Some people don't learn that lesson. Some people go right back into the world. They go back and face all the struggles and the cares and the, uh, that, that choke them out. According to Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. Go back and face all the trials of life instead of dwelling in the house of the Lord. I hope you learned the lesson. I hope you learned your lesson. So the first thing you need to learn from Jacob is you need some education. Going to the house of the Lord requires education. Here's what else it requires. It requires purification. It requires purification. In Genesis 35 and verse 2, let's go back to our text here. Genesis 35, verses 2 through 4. Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak tree which is by Shechem. Now, it takes some purification. If you're going to come to the house of God, you're going to have to be separated from some things that are not of God. You see, separation has to be made before you ever go to the house of God. Separation has to be made. Here it is. God is a holy God, my friends. 
God is a holy God. Habakkuk said he can't even stand to look upon sin. Habakkuk 2.14, I believe it is. The first, the first commandments that he gave to Moses on the, on the mountain were pertaining to his holiness. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not, make, shalt not make unto me any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, earth beneath, or, or in the waters, or in the earth beneath. Don't bow down yourself to them. Don't have any gods between you and me. God is a holy God. He is sanctified. He is separated. And if you want to come to the house of God, you've got to put away all of the sin that's standing between you and God. That's what Jacob had to do. All the strange gods, you've got to put those away. You can't go to the house of God and bring your false gods and bring your, your idols in with you. Here's why. Because sin creates a wedge. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Isaiah said that God won't hear your prayers. Notice this. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. This is why we say the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. It's not scriptural. No one, no one, an alien sinner, I'm talking about someone outside the body of Christ, not a part of the house of God. That is, they're not a Christian. No one ever got initial forgiveness of sins by saying a sinner's prayer because iniquities have separated between you and God and he will not hear. Not that he cannot. It's just that he chooses not to. He may hear you, but he won't listen to you. He may hear, but he doesn't heed. See, sin separates you from God. You have to do what God says in order to have those sins forgiven where you can actually be on speaking terms with God. You've got to come to God and you have to have some purification. To come to God, your garments must be changed. See what happens? When, when Jacob was told to go to the house of God, go to Bethel, you got to put off some garments. you got to change your clothes. you got to change the filthy rags that are covered in sin, and you've got to, be, you've got to be, uh, have some purification. So you've got to be purified. Now notice this. If you want to worship, you must be pure. You must be pure. In John 4, in verse 23, I, I, if that person's calling for me, we're going to put the phone lines up in just a little bit. So if you want to just wait off on calling, I hear the phone ringing. If you want to wait off on calling, we'll take your calls in a little bit. But in John 4, John 4 and verse 23, notice this. Jesus talking to the woman at the well. The hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. For God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Listen, true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. Spirit is your attitude. Truth is God's Word, John 17, 17. Thy Word is truth. And if you don't have a right heart with God, you're not a true worshiper. You're not a true worshiper. You've got to be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to put away all the things that God does not approve of in order to worship God. Jesus even put it this way in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Speaking to the, uh, the, the intent of the heart or speaking to the importance of having a pure heart when you come to worship God, he says this. He says, if you remember... If you come to the altar with your gift and you remember you have all against your brother, you need to leave your gift at the altar. Go and be first be reconciled to your brother. Then come and worship. Then come and offer the gift. God wants you right in your heart. Now, friends, let's, let's think about this. Let's be honest here. You have to have a willing heart that says, I'm going to put away all the things that God does not approve of if I'm going to come to the house of God. Someone comes along and says to me, well, I'm going to come to God just as I am. We sing a song just as I am. You come just as you are, but you don't stay just the way you are. You have to make some changes. 
Now, I know that doctrine of once saved, always saved is very appealing because what it does, friends, it does not insist that people change the way they're living. If the doctrine of once saved, always saved is true, you don't have to be pure when you worship God. You can go out and sin, and we've had Baptist preachers and Baptist members of the Baptist church on this program, on this TV station, come on and say, yeah, you can fornicate and die and still go to heaven. Well, you know what? If you can fornicate and still go to heaven, I bet you can fornicate and still go to worship. And how many people in the Baptist church are doing that great thing? How many people in the Baptist church are out there drinking carrying on, living righteous living, and then they go to worship on Sunday morning. You know what? In the church of Christ, we talk about drinking. We preach against it. We fight against it. And some of you people call in, well, I'm a member of the church, and I run a pub, and I go to church on Sunday morning. When I get there, or you have so-called Christian television stations in Martinsville that are actually uh, uh, sponsoring or promoting Bars and clubs that sell alcohol. Well, you know what? If you can promote it, then why don't you engage in it? And if you can engage in it, see what's left. You must not think that it defiles you. See? I've been, I've been out here to these houses of worship where the churches of men assemble. You know what I see outside? I see big old cigarette uh, things where people put their cigarettes and they, where they ain't smoke outside. In the church of Christ, we talk about that. We talk about purifying your life. You can't be doing that. But if one saved, always saved is true, more that, that'd be nice. I don't have to, I can come to God as I am and stay just as I am. Oh, no. No. You can come as you are, but you have to obey God and change. See? Put off the old man and put on the new man, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You can't stay living the way you are. Sometimes you may have to give up that person you're living with too. See? You want to come to the house of God, it takes some purification. Education, number one, education. The best place to go is go to the Lord, go to the house of God. But before you go to the house of God, you better be purified. You first better be purified. And then when you get to the house of God, this is what you need to think about. There's some commemoration. There's some commemoration. In other words, there ought to be something that makes you think about how good God is. In Genesis 35 and verse 5, listen to what Jacob says. Let's read it again. Genesis 35 and verse 5. I'm sorry. 35 and verse 3. Jacob said, let us arise, I'll make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. I remember what God has done for me. That's what going to the house of God ought to do for you. It ought to make you remember what God has done for you. You know, a lot of times we forget the goodness that God has given. The caller on the previous program came, called in and quoted John 3, 16. God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Oh, that's a wonderful verse. But you know what? If you don't go to the house of God, you don't really fully appreciate what God has truly done for you. Because the goodness of God the goodness of God ought to make you think about just how much God has sacrificed for you. And it ought to make you, it ought to make you reflect on how much you actually owe God. Look at this. Let's skip down to this. In Romans 2 and verse 4, Romans 2 and verse 4, Paul says, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and the long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? The very fact that God has made a way for you to repent 
and actually commands you to repent, begs you to repent, does not want any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8 and 9, is all because of God's goodness and long-suffering. And yet when people go to the house of God, they don't think about that. They think, well, God is so good that he's, he's done everything for me and I don't have to do a single thing back for him. Now let's face it, neighbors. Those of you who say you don't believe in work salvation, that you do nothing, that you don't have to do anything, flies in the face of God's goodness. God's goodness demands that we serve him. I'm not saying that you can earn your salvation, but I'm saying it demands that you serve him because of the goodness and the mercy that he's bestowed upon us. You want a verse for that? Look at Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But to those of you who say, well, I don't have to do a single thing. Well, saved always say, I'm saved by the grace of God. I didn't do anything for it. I can't do anything to lose it. And therefore, I'm not going to have to do anything to keep it. Paul says it's a reasonable service to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That sounds like something you do. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, when you come to worship, when you go to the house of God, it ought to make you think about the good things that God's done for you. Let me talk to, to some brethren out there. Brethren, when you don't assemble with the house of God, when you don't assemble with the house of God, you miss an opportunity to be reminded about what, is, what God has done for you. Why not, why not go to Bethel when you start to realize what God has done? If you really believe that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, why do you wind up in a church that he never talked about? If you believe that God has done so much good for you, why do you go over and worship him in a way that he never asked you for? He never told you to worship. Why do you insist on giving him all the instruments of man, the praise that man says he, that God wants, the, 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 uh, uh, the mode of teaching or the doctrines of men that God never spoke of and be in a church that his son never died for. Is that really what the goodness of God leads you to do? I say you actually despise the sacrifice that he made. You despise the sacrifice that our Lord made when he sent his only begotten son when you're sitting there in a man-made church pretending, believing, thinking that you're worshiping God. Paul says in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, that's the house of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ, deity, purchased the church with his own blood. And people say, well, it ain't important. Oh, the church is not important. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to be in assembly. You know what? That tells me right there, you don't remember and you don't think about and you don't even consider the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. Why, why do you despise the sacrifice that Christ made in order to build his church, Bethel, the house of God, the house of the living God, which is his church. Why do you despise it? Romans 8 and verse 32 says that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Why don't you assemble with the house of God? You need to stop and think about the good things God has done for you. And on the first day of the week when the house of God, the church of Christ assembles together. One of the things they do to commemorate 
and think about the goodness of God is they partake of the Lord's Supper. They partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, some calls came in earlier that was talking about the Lord's Supper and how we do things in the Church of Christ according to the Scripture. Let me tell you something, friends. I know there's times when people who aren't members of the Church of Christ have been served. And Daniel, the, t the, the time you're talking about, I don't recall. I wasn't serving. But I know this. We always stress you must be a member of the Church of Christ, the House of God, in order for that to be a blessing for you. If you're outside the body of Christ, you're not doing anything but eating unleavened bread and fruit and drinking some uh, grape juice. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. In the church of Christ, the house of God, here's what the Lord's Supper, the memorial feast, means to us. It's designed to make us remember the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, those outside the body of Christ and those who are in different houses, men's houses, houses of men, like the house that John Smith built, the Baptist church, one thing that they believe and what they teach is that the kingdom hasn't come. They're still looking for the kingdom. Most of them still looking for the kingdom. They're looking for a time when Christ is going to come back and reign for a thousand years. And so they don't believe the kingdom has come. Well, look at this. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, if you're partaking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine in order to remember Christ, why are you doing it if you don't believe the kingdom has come? Why are you partaking of it, fellowshipping with Christ, which is exactly what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians, let's look at this, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ? We're partaking of that one bread and one body, and we're partakers of that one bread. We're fellowshipping with Christ. Christ said He wasn't going to fellowship in that memorial feast until the Father, until the kingdom came. So if you're partaking of the Lord's Supper and you don't believe the kingdom has come, why are you even partaking of it? What difference does it make? Why are you upset if you're not served it? And if you partake of it and you don't believe it, then you don't even understand what you're doing. See, folks outside the body of Christ to partake of the Lord's Supper, to them it's just a little snack. I don't know. I don't know why they want to take of it. As far as food goes, it's, it's not much. It's not anything really. But to Christians who are inside the body of Christ and who know that it is a fellowship with Christ and who know that it is a communion with Christ and who know that Christ is communing with us because His kingdom has come and has been established, it means everything to us. Now, like I said, I know there's been times in the church of Christ where I am that people have been served who are not members of the body of Christ. But it's not because it hadn't been taught. And it's not because they haven't been informed. Maybe it was an oversight or whatever, but I know this. We strive to stress the importance of being in the church in order to have fellowship with Christ. And if you are not in that church, there's no way you have fellowship with Christ just because you're taking some fruit of the vine and unleavened bread. But we don't want to send a mixed signal. We don't want to say, if you're not in the church of Christ, you're not in fellowship with God, but here in the memorial feast, we're fellowshipping with God, so here, take it. We try to be, we can, to be consistent. Not send mixed signals. But believe it or not, 
believe it or not, I know this is going to be a great uh, surprise to a lot of people, but you know what? We're not perfect. But you know what? We've gone back and talked to people. You know what? This is really what you need to do for this to mean anything to you. You need to obey the gospel. Come out of these man-made churches. Come to the church of Christ. Become a member of the body of Christ. A lively stone in the house of God. When you come to the house of God and you're a member of the church of God, uh, the church of God, the church that Christ paid for, you know what? You'll get education. You'll have purification. And then you can have commemoration. You can actually... Remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, I've got one more point I want to make, but I'm going to go ahead and open the phone lines. Put the phone numbers up if you would, Matt. <clears throat> we'll take some phone calls if you're out there and want to talk. But it's all about getting back to the house of God. The church that Christ established. The house of the living God. A spiritual house. It requires education. It requires purification and it allows you to offer up a commemoration a remembering of the death brown resurrection of Christ but here's the most important thing alright we're going to take a phone call you on the air yes I would like to ask the preacher what is the reason for getting baptized well how about we just go to the Bible okay Let, let's, just, let's just go to the Bible Okay. The purpose of baptism is in this phrase right here. Let's read the verse. Peter said unto them, Repent. Verse 37, they said, What, what shall we do? All right. And here's the answer. What shall we do to be saved is what they're asking. He's convicted them of sin. They've killed Christ. What shall we do? Here's what you'll do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, Right here's the phrase, for the remission of sins. So the purpose of being baptized is for the remission of sins. Now, nowhere in the Bible will you ever hear someone be told their sins are forgiven, now go be baptized. Baptism always comes before remission of sins. Okay? Okay. Anything else? Now there's other things that baptism does, but this is the purpose of someone being baptized is for the remission of sins. You, you want to comment? Any follow-up questions? I want to know how do you go about getting saved? Okay, well, we just answered part of it right there. In other words, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I suspect you do. Do you? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Okay. So, so a person must believe. Here's why. Let's explain why. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24. We're going to take a little time here. John 8, 24. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am He, you'll die in your sins. So if you don't believe He's the Son of God, you'll die in your sins. So a person must believe that He is the Son of God. All right? Then a person must Repent of their sins. If you believe that Jesus is the Lord, then it must be that you have been serving your own self. You've been serving another Lord. So you have to repent. You have to repent of, of not serving Christ. A repent To repent means to change after knowing. Okay? So you repent of your sins. Why? Well, because God commands it, number one. Acts 17, verse 30. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So if you, if you don't believe, you're going to be lost. But believing is not enough. You've got to repent too. He commanded people to believe. He commanded them to repent. Now, here's something else you've got to do. If you repent of your sins, Lord, I, I haven't been serving you. What should I do? Well, now you've got to confess. What do you confess? Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. You confess that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, you confess your faith so that everyone knows it. You confess what you believe. In Acts 8 and verse 36, Philip was preaching Christ. 
And they came to a water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, here's his confession, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he made the confession, I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God. He confessed his faith. And then, what happened? He was baptized. They commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Why did he baptize him? Why did Philip baptize the eunuch? For the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Baptism is for the remission of sins. So, what must a person do to be saved? They have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They have to repent of their sins. In other words, repent for not living the way they, they should have been living. Make the confession, Jesus is the Son of God, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, watch this. Watch what baptism does. Because a lot of people think that, well, I'm baptized, that's all I have to do. No, here's what, what happens. Baptism actually puts you in a place... Of, of great honor. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We've already read what they did to be saved. But God puts them in the church. Now, did you know in the Baptist church, you have to be voted on if you're going to be a member of the Baptist church? Are you a member of the Baptist church? Ma'am? Hello? Uh, I'm a member of the uh, family of God. But are you are you a member of some uh, local denomination? If you're a member of the Baptist Church, you were voted on. Well, now, could I ask you a question? You were you were voted on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did Jesus die on the cross for our sins to pay for our sins? He did. He did. Yes, he did. So, uh, but does that mean our sins are, are forgiven just because he died? I think if you are a member of the Baptist Church, you have to be born again. Now, ma'am, I've given you I've given you verses about what the Bible says to be saved. Can you give me a verse for what you're saying the Bible says to be saved? Well, could I ask you another question? I, well, if you'll give me a verse, I'll, I'll show everybody. Show me the verse where it says whatever you just said it to do. I ask, 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 ask to be born again. What is supposed to be telling me? Is it a sin to judge people? Now, ma'am, but, but here's the thing, though. You asked me a question, and I answered it, and then you gave a rebuttal. Now, what you said, well, this is actually what I believe. I believe the Bible says to ask to be born again. And I'm saying, please give the verse. And you, want to, and you want to get upset because I ask you to produce the verse and you want to go to judging. You know, I'm not like you. I don't get upset. Well, would you please... I just want to know... I'm asking a, you kindly, would you please give a verse for it says... To judge people. Would you please... If you'll give the verse that says, ask to be born again and you're saved, then we'll go on to judging. But I don't. I want to finish the topic we're on. I would like to. I don't have my Bible in front of me. Well, then how do you know that it says that? Because I've read it before. Well, ma'am, if you don't know where it's found, how how can you tell someone else? The Bible says, "Give an answer." Do you, you not believe in born, being born again? I do, but I don't believe you're born again, born again, by simply asking to be born again. The Bible says this is how you're born again. You're begotten by the water and the word. John okay, 3 so verse 5, you're born of the water and the spirit. We've discussed that. Is it a sin to judge people? Not righteous judgment, it's not. Is that God's job? It's not a sin to judge righteous judgment. John 7, 24. Don't it say it's... Judge lest you be judged. It says, Judge not lest you be not judged. For right. with what measure... No words. Let's watch it. Let's just put it up here where you can read it. Because the, the, the problem is not in judging. The problem 
is the standard that you're judging by. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If I, if I'm using the Bible to determine if something's right and wrong, I'm not going to get mad if you use the Bible to, to see if I'm telling you something that's right and wrong. Well, see, I go by the Bible, too. Well, well, ma'am, how do I know that you haven't given me a verse? Huh? Am I judging, am I judging you in some way? No, I hear you judging other people. Uh, well, well are, are, you, are you making a judgment about me by saying I'm judging other people? No, I was asking you if judging was a sin. And I said, no, it's not. I said, no, it's not a sin. Not righteous judgment's not. John 7, 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, is that sin if I do that? Is it a sin if I judge righteous judgment? I think so. It, uh, one more time. It's a, is it a sin if I judge righteous judgment? I don't think you're supposed to judge anybody. This is Jesus' words, ma'am. Jesus I think says judge. When people fall down, Christians, you don't keep them down by judging them. You help them up and pray for them and help them. Ma'am. Instead that, that's of not, judging them and talking bad. But see, you're making a judgment by saying people fall down. You're making a judgment. Well, that person fell. When you say someone fell, you say, you're making a judgment. See, Jesus said judge righteous judgment, and you said it's wrong to I'm do that. judging anybody. You said it's wrong to do this. Jesus said do this, and you said it's wrong to do it. I said I think... Well, I'm saying Jesus said to judge righteous judgment. Is it a sin to do what Jesus said? But what I'm telling you is, when people fall down and have problems, do you think Christian people never fall down? I didn't say it. No, I don't think that. I think they fall down all the time. But I don't think it's wrong to judge righteous judgment to know if they fell down. According to what you're saying about judging, don't you, you, don't get to, you don't get to tell anybody they've fallen. You don't know if time. someone fell, you couldn't say it. I'm saying judge righteous judgment. Jesus said do it. Should we do it or not? You should pray for people and listen. Should you, should you do what Jesus said in this verse? Put down should and you, hold I'm going to ask you one more time, ma'am. I'm going to ask you one more time and I'm going to let you go. Should we do what Jesus said in this verse? Judge righteous judgment. Should we do it or not? I don't think y'all do anything right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that judgment. Man, it's, it's, like, it's like beating your head against the wall. Jesus said judge, and the lady said, I don't think you should do that. That's wrong. Well, take it up with Jesus. I didn't write the book. Yes, sir. You're on the air. Yeah, I just want to tell you, uh, the Church of Christ comes into my house every week a couple of times, but... Uh, Earlier today, they were talking about we had 300 churches in Danville. Yes, sir. And uh, suppose we didn't have but one or two churches in Danville, then then what would it be like? You know, that's that's, that's what kind of I've been thinking about. You know, well, it'd be like, nice if we only had one kind of churches, one kind of church. You could still have the 300 buildings, but if they were all teaching the same thing and all had the same mind and the same judgment, boy, it'd be a, it, Danville would be a great place to live. Yes, sir. That'd well, be let me place. ask you this. Uh, if a person, like I'm, I'm watching you now, and I watch you every week, and I also watch uh, another two or three uh, programs uh, to do with uh, sermon religion and Bible teaching, and uh, I, well, I also watch... Uh, a man down in Arkansas, I won't call his name, but some people say he is, he's wrong, and he's, uh... Arnold Murray? Yes, sir. Yeah, he's wrong. I'll judge him. Well, I'll why do you say he's wrong when he, when he says uh, you can read the Bible right behind it, right on the screen it's written, mm -hmm. chapter for chapter and verse for verse? I know. How but, can you say a man is wrong when he's, when he's, uh... What well, just let, like, let me just give you a quick for instance. I'm, 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 right now. I know, uh, but well, let me just give you a quick. Say, okay, let me give you a, well, uh, sir. A 
Let me give you a quick for instance. I'm, run, I'm running up against the clock, though. I'm running, up, I'm running up against the clock. Let me give you why I say that. Yes, you can read along with Arnold Murray, but do you believe do you believe the devil had sex with a woman? I mean, that, that's crazy stuff. The serpent, the serpent had sex with a woman, and that's where, you know, that's where the children of, of the devil come from. Now, come on. Well, Angels had sex with women. That's what Arnold Murray teaches. Crazy well, talk. Say that, that, that almost every preacher uh, sometimes says things that that later on they uh, say, well, maybe they were wrong about it. I, but yeah, I've but I, but Arnold that, Murray hadn't said that. He, he would, anything. you know, he would hold to that. There's some other things about Arnold Murray that you know what we need to do a program on Arnold Murray just to show some of the. Uh, uh, errors, doctrinal errors. Let's make some righteous judgments about this man in order to show what he's teaching and what he's not, what he, uh, what he's teaching wrong. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Listen, I, I've got another call, and I'm hey, okay. I'm running this clock, but I, I really appreciate your call. Appreciate your show right. and uh, your program. I mean, and uh, you know, I still believe in the, your doctrine, the Church of Christ, and. Uh, I'll still listen to you, even if I don't get to your church. I'll, I'll watch you on television. And, okay. Uh, well, me, I, that's the Bible lesson. I, and uh, when I read my Bible, then uh, I'll let you go, sir. All right. Yeah, Thanks for calling. Night. All right. Bless. All right. I don't, I don't have a church, and, I, and I'm, I know he knows that. But anyway, we'd, we'd be glad for you to be in any of our assemblies. Visit with us. You on the air? Yes. Yes, sir. Talking about in Acts 238. Yes, sir. Why, why didn't you read the last part of that scripture? Because she was wanting to know what to do to be saved. She wasn't wanting to know about the Holy Spirit. What's wrong with that scripture? There's nothing wrong with that scripture. Acts 238. Here it is. Yes. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. What about it? And then it says in 39 that's for, for everybody. No. As it, many as long as I got calling. That, that promise. That promise is not to, is not is not about the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's not. I mean, no. Because the Bible, then God wrote, wrote the Bible wrong, right? No, you're reading it wrong. Because the Bible says, says for, for that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto what you promise? your children. What promise? Them that are far off. What is the promise? What that God call it. Are you are you a preacher? Can we go on the record? Are you a preacher? Yes. Okay, and where do you preach? What's your name and where do you preach? I don't I don't have a church. I'm just an evangelist. I didn't say you had a church. I said, where do you preach? Well, I don't preach. I'm just an evangelist. So what I mean, what religious a, group I are you affiliated with? Anybody asked me. What's your name? Well, listen, hey. What, what's your name? We don't have anything to do with what, what the Yes, Bible it does. Says. You're, you're, you're an authority. You're a preacher. What's your name? Look, I, you don't need to know my Jimmy name. Jimmy Roach. You know is that Reverend Roach. Are we right? Let's go ahead and say it. Reverend Roach. Hey, listen. Okay, my now, name. this is Reverend Roach. If it's not, he'll deny it. You're not going to change people's minds. Listen, mind. sir. You're not going to change people's minds with your false doctrine. Listen, sir. You can't tell us what the promise is. The the pro promise you're is saying the, the promise is the Holy Ghost? Does everybody, does everybody in churches where you preach have the Holy Ghost? Well, well uh, they got their speaking point. D but does everybody have it? No, no, everybody don't have it, but they can't. Does everybody get it when they're baptized? Oh, it just has scripture right there. Everybody can have it. Does Does everybody get it when they're baptized? No. So then, you, so then why didn't God give it to them? They didn't believe. No, no, they believed they were baptized. Hey. You baptize, you baptize someone who doesn't believe? Guys, you, if you ain't been baptized, you lied. You, you, All right, did you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost when you was baptized? I didn't. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a miraculous gift. Why, why didn't you do it? Because you no, didn't you supposed to do what the Scripture says right there. No, because the Scriptures are talking to a group of people in a day when miraculous gifts were still being given. And they were given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Acts 8, verse 17. In other words, everybody, the, everybody who was baptized did not receive a gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, but let me make this you know how I know that? Because in Acts chapter 8, you have a man named Simon the sorcerer who was baptized. He believed and was baptized, and he didn't get the gift of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, nobody in Samaria got the gift of the Holy Spirit until the apostles came down. Now, 
Let me ask you a question. Go ahead. We're running out of time. Uh, we're running out of time. Go, go ahead. Do you think God has respect to person? No, I don't. All right. If, if, if the Apostle Peter could speak in tongues, I can speak in tongues. I can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because if I can't, then God showed respect between me and the Apostle Peter. Okay. That, and, that's, and that's a good thing. That's a good argument. Does everybody in the churches where you preach have the gift of tongues? No. no. I, don't think, I don't think you do. No, they don't. So God must be a respecter of persons. But I'm just saying that, that they can have but, it. Sir. I'm not saying that they, don't, they but, sir. can have it. I but, think sir. they can have it. But, but sir, but, sir, you just, you just answered your own argument. God, if, if Peter can do it, you can do it. Well, if Peter can do it, everybody else can do it. But you just admitted that everybody else in the churches where you preach don't have it. You know what? But if you would give up this false doctrine, if you give up, if you would give up this false doctrine about everybody getting a miraculous gift, you'd be consistent with the Bible. The Bible says that. Now, listen, I didn't say that I always about these miraculous things like this. I'm just saying that that the, Jesus told us this. He said, "You see what I do, sir." He said, he said "And who who was he talking to?" Can do greater things than who, what I do. And who was he talking to? And Blind, Hello? Blind, Hello? Who was he talking to? Dumb. Who was he talking to? He was, talking, he was talking to the disciples. To the apostles. Let's get it right. The apostles. Not just the disciples. The apostles. The twelve. They had the power. But I sir. The disciples. But sir. The gift of the Holy Spirit was not given to everybody who was baptized. Because right here. Simon believed and was baptized and continued with Philip, but he didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know? Was you there? I'm reading the Bible. Oh, I, I read the Bible too, but see. I, sir, sir, are you going to listen? Listen, Simon did not receive the Holy Spirit because he was, he came down there and noticed when the, when the apostles came, Philip and John, Peter and John came, he saw that through the, right here, verse 17. Through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the, the, the uh, Holy Ghost was given. Simon didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized. It took the laying on of the apostles' hands. How did you get it? I, I prayed and asked God for it and God gave it. No, no one got the Holy Spirit that way. Well, then, all I know is that what I know... Give me the verse that God, says pray and God will give you the Holy Spirit. Nobody else can ever... You came too late to tell me, tell me <clears> something that... I, I, I've been knowing ever since I was a young child. Well, sir, all I know is you're a preacher, so-called Reverend Roach, which I'd like to ask, why, why do you call yourself Reverend? Well, I mean, the same reason you call yourself uh, uh, James Oldfield. I that was the name my mama gave me. Your mama gave you the name Reverend? Heaven don't have a thing to do with me going to heaven, heaven or hell. You, you're wearing God's name? Well, hey, listen. You're wearing a name that belongs to God. Hey, let me ask you a question. You're, you're wearing the name that belongs to God. That's all right with you? Hey, let me ask you a question. How about all these people that's, that's named uh, Jesus, calling Jesus? What about it? Wrong? Is that wrong? I'm sorry? Is that wrong? No. Well, then, if they wrong for them to be named Jesus, well, I it wrong for me to say Reverend. Because they're not Jesus the Christ. But you're wearing a name, Christ. Holy and Reverend is his name. Hey, I'm not Jesus Christ. You're, you're, wearing, the, you're wearing a name that belongs to the Lord. You're wearing a title that belongs to the Lord, Reverend. Man, I tell you what. So, so, so you just put yourself in the place of God. When this world comes to an end. You sure you don't want to tell everybody where you, where you preach? So, when this world comes to an end, you are going to be the most fool human being that ever lived on God's earth. Sir. Because I may die and go to hell. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not at you preaching I'm perfect. Okay. I'm just saying that I, I that I, that I, I'm a, I, I was a sinner, but now I'm saved by grace. Well, I know this. And, and the Bible tells me that I must have the blood applied in order to be saved. But sir. I ain't got the blood applied to me. So do you want, I don't care. I okay, to all right. Me. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm way over time, but I want to give you this chance. You want to tell everybody where they can come and hear you preach? And getting more of your, your great learning? I don't know what I'm going to preach. Reverend, Reverend? I don't ever know what I'm going to preach. Roach. Well, where do, you, where do you preach when you do preach? Well, I mean, I mean let me tell you something. What, what churches around here support you? I'll tell you what churches 
important to me. Okay. To please the right way. And and those are? Those are? The, what? Any of them. I can go to any church other than your church and preach. I don't have a church. Which churches do you go to preach at? Because if you had a if you had the right kind of church, you wouldn't be on TV. Are you are you judging me where I am? Bye. All right, that's what I thought. Sorry, I can't take the call. I'm out of time. Uh, I'd like to get to this last point, but I just don't uh, don't have the time. I want to give you uh, uh, some contact information where you can uh, reach us before we go off the air. If you'd like to visit with us and hear plain preaching where the preacher's not called reverend, doesn't wear, doesn't wear the name of God, you can meet with us at 2, at two feet of the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. Till next time, friends, always ask what does the Bible say, and you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.